Hello everyone and welcome back to another AAC video. For those of you coming across the Animal Artist Collective for the first time, we are a group of artists here on YouTube founded by Jennifer Charlie and myself that create artwork every other month in order to raise awareness and donation funds for various conservation efforts around the globe. Our theme in 2019 is animal groups, and this month we got a little bit funky because we are doing extinct animals. Some artists, like myself, have chosen to do animals that have long since gone from our planet, while others are tackling the more sensitive topic of animals that have gone extinct in our very recent history, including in our lifetimes and even our parents' lifetimes. Whether you want to have fun watching us paint some dinosaurs or learn what you can do to help to stop or slow human impact on other species sharing our planet, I hope you'll check out everyone's videos from the collective this round, all of the links of which are in the description below. You probably all know by now what a passionate conservationalist I am, so it was actually hard for me to not tackle a more currently relevant species for today's world and climate. However, what you may not know about me is that I'm actually also a massive dinosaur nerd. When I began working on staff at the zoo, one of my first huge projects was overhauling their dinosaur camp curriculum, and I loved every single gosh darn second of it. Researching and writing about dinosaurs completely rekindled my childhood love for them, which originally spawned from the legendary James Gurney's artwork in Dinotopia, which as an aside, if you guys don't already know, James Gurney is here on YouTube, which I didn't know until like a year ago. It's amazing. He's amazing. So go watch his channel. My favorite dinosaur ever since I was a kid because of James Gurney's artwork has always been Parasaurolophus, or more colloquially all known as the duck-billed dinosaur. Some of you who have been around the channel for a while might remember a video I did last summer doing a sketchbook spread of this dinosaur, so the link for that video will be in the description below, but it also meant that I needed to pick a new species for today's video. I went through a lot of potential ideas, like talking about velociraptors and how the quote-unquote velociraptors from the Jurassic Park movies are actually based on another species called Deinonychus, or how myosaurs were actually named, in quotes, the good mother lizards because their fossils have been found around nests full of eggs and babies. Another thing I absolutely love talking about with dinosaurs is that dinosaurs only lived on land. And when I asked what your favorite dinosaur was over on the community tab here on YouTube a little while back, many of you guys actually said Plesiosaurus or Pterodactyl, which would have been a great way to open up that discussion since flying and swimming reptiles alive during the same time period as the dinosaurs weren't actually dinosaurs themselves. Now, it would be a total tangent for me to go off on this topic uh, in the middle of this video, but if you want to hear more about that, ask me down below and I'll let you know a quick way to ID dinosaurs versus non-dinosaurs. But anyway, there's another really cool topic that I came across while researching those dino camp curriculums that always really fascinated with me, and that is our perception on the paleontological timeline. One thing that's particularly hard to grasp for us adults, let alone teach to children, is just how long ago dinosaurs lived on Earth, how long of a time span they lived for, and how the species that we typically see in pop culture never really actually existed in the same time frame, let alone having to consider where on the planet they lived. As you can probably tell by now in the video, I decided to choose good old Stegosaurus, who is thought to have lived around 150 million years ago, give or take a few million years, during the Jurassic period, and I'll come back to them in just a few moments. But I want to talk a little bit about the relativity of the different dinosaur species first. Oftentimes we grow up thinking that Tyrannosaurus rex is just the main predator of all the other dinosaurs, but they actually lived around 66 million years ago during the Cretaceous period. Meaning that, and this is what I found so incredibly fascinating, is that we actually lived closer in time to Tyrannosaurus rex than Stegosaurus did since they were 150 million years, 66 million years today. You know, it's, it's pretty crazy. 
So with this concept in mind, I wanted to kind of play on that and go ahead and paint an allosaurus in my painting since they are my favorite theropods and they actually lived around the same time as Stegosaurus. But then it occurred to me and I was like, whoa, Denise, what are you doing? You are overlooking a huge opportunity to incorporate one of your other absolute favorite things in this piece. So maybe do that instead. While watching this, you might be thinking this is kind of a weird color palette for me and you'd be right because I wouldn't typically choose blue for a dinosaur, but alas, the color palette that I used for this piece was not entirely my own. Have the brown coats figured it out yet? That's right, Firefly fans, these are Wash's dinosaurs. In case you've missed that tidbit about me over the years, Firefly is my absolute favorite TV show, so once I realized that I had already picked a Stegosaurus, I had to try and replicate these little dudes. So to the best of my ability, I approximated that the other dinosaur in our beloved scene was something along the lines of a Ceratosaurus. Smaller than the Allosaurus, the Ceratosaurus was another theropod alive during the late Jurassic, but would work just fine for this piece, which I'm giving kudos to the creators of Firefly for picking two dinosaurs that were alive at the same time. I don't know if that was intentional or not, but it worked out. I don't know much about Ceratosaurus, but in doing a quick bit of research, I did find out that they have a pretty unique feature among theropods, and that is the presence of small osteoderms, or skin bones, along either side of their spine. Osteoderms are present in other armored dinosaurs like Ankylosaurus or the Stegosaurus even, and also in modern day animals like crocodilians and armadillos, but they're not usually present in theropods. Coming back to Stegosaurus, these dinos were never really at the top of my favorite list, although I know that they're at the top of many others. It shouldn't entirely shock anyone though when I point out that I have my incredibly strong affinity for portraiture work, whether in photography or in art, it's just kind of what I gravitate towards, and stegosauruses have really tiny heads that are hard to see in comparison with the other grand features of their body, like their plates and their thacomizers. However, I have always found them completely fascinating to research, and plus we had a pretty catchy stegosaurus camp song that would get stuck in your head on loop for days on end, so what's not to love? <laughs> Anywho, their name means roofed lizard, which comes from the fact that th when the fossils were first found, their highly specialized osteoderms, or the plates that they have on their back, were laid down like shingles on a roof rather than pointing upward. However, since their original discovery, several other arrangements have been found and suggested as more probable outcomes. The most widely recognized hypothesis today is that there were two rows slightly alternating down their midline. However, their function is still hotly debated. Originally, they were thought to be armor or defense, but the plates were not connected to their spine and they're very fragile. So while they would protect the back of the animal, perhaps, their fleshy sides were still left unprotected. This was discredited as a theory, but then later scientists came back around to it, finding evidence that the plates were most likely covered in keratin, similar to how a rhino's horn looks, making them a bit more convincing as defensive structures. Another hypothesis was that they could have been used to regulate body temperature by pushing blood through the highly vascularized plates, similarly to how an elephant regulates their body temperature with their large ears. However, this has been questioned because other similar species to the Stegosaurus that have much smaller plates with less surface area. So the idea that they all universally kind of needed these plates to cool themselves off has been questioned. A further hypothesis is that they were for display, either or both for intimidating enemies by making them look much larger than they actually were, and or as a mating display, as males tend to have wider plates while females were slimmer and taller. Along with the aforementioned idea of using the plates for thermoregulation, it was also thought that they could flush color into the plates for a flashy display, but the idea of them being covered with keratin that was later found directly conflicts with this idea, since the keratin would make the color not possible to see unless it was implementing things that we don't know exist. Basically, we don't know, but it's fun to kind of guess what these animals used to look like or what their features were for. What we do know is that it's incredibly likely that the spikes at the end of the tail, called thagomizers, were used as a weapon. This idea is reinforced by finding trauma on these bones, as well as other paleontological evidence suggesting that their tails were more flexible than many other dinosaurs, meaning that they'd have more mobility to use them, indeed, as a weapon. 
There are so many other things that I could talk to you about regarding these amazing animals, but as you guys know, if you saw last week's video, I am smack dab in the middle of a move and really have to get back to packing. If you want to know more about what's going on in my personal life, go ahead and check out last week's video where I explained all of that. And as I mentioned, I will be missing again for the next couple of weeks. Maybe sooner if I get lucky. It just depends on when my movers deliver all my stuff and how fast I can get my new studio set up. I do hope that you enjoyed my video and this art piece this time around. It's no Mary Sanchez dinosaur painting. I love her. She's amazing and dinosaur goals, but I did the best that I could in the limited time I had to work on it. And I just realized that I forgot to tell you about the actual art supplies that I used. This is Schwinka Hordam gouache on Arches 140 pound cold press paper. I used a size four flat shader from Princeton Velvet Touch as the majority of the painting, and then also used a small Escoda Perla for details. This piece is for sale, as are all pieces in the AAC, but since my Etsy shop is closed for the move, we're going to have to do it a little bit differently this time around. I'll go ahead and list the price and all the details on how to contact me if you're interested in the painting in the description below this video. If you'd like to purchase it and help support the Sierra Club with 50% of the profit going to them, I can set up an invoice through PayPal. If there's enough interest in the artwork itself, I may get prints or stickers made of this after my move is all settled, so do let me know if that's something that you'd like to see in the comments below. Be sure to check out the other artist videos in the collective. We've got more dinosaurs, we've got some Ice Age creatures, and we even have some more recently extinct species, all of which are bound to cover a vast and exciting range of information. We also have our poll up over on Facebook for the next week or so, so you can vote on our next theme in July. And be sure to share those dinos or other extinct animals on Instagram with the hashtag animal artists with an S collective so we can go ahead and see them too. And until next time, happy painting. Mm -hmm.